I had the honor to do an interview with one of my favorite scientists, Donald D. Hoffman. Brilliant mind, did an amazing TED talk. And in the interview, we are talking about the nature of consciousness and reality. And I created this t-shirt, Donald D. Hoffman doesn't think it's real, because he believes that all of reality is an interface with which consciousness interacts with other conscious agents. Very fascinating idea. Let's dive deep into the conversation and explore the nature of reality and consciousness. Most of us think that space is the fundamental stage, the pre-existing stage in which the drama of life plays out. And that matter, physical objects are, you know, are part of this fundamental reality and consciousness is a latecomer in, in that, that realm. And I've, I've been working with some mathematicians and we've proven that uh, the probability that our perceptions of space and time and physical objects is, is telling us anything true about objective reality is zero. Mm -hmm. this, this is a theorem that follows from evolution by natural selection. If our senses evolved and were shaped by natural selection, the probability is zero that any of our perceptions are telling us the truth about objective reality. Mm -hmm. um, so that's in, in particular the space time and physical objects. Um, when we see an apple, that's, we, we assume that that's because in objective reality, there is an apple and we're just sort of taking a picture of that apple. And that is contradicted by the theory of evolution by natural selection. The probability that we see as, as, um, Perception scientists call it veridically, see the see truly, is is zero. And so, what that means to me is that space and time are not the framework, the pre-existing stage in which we exist. They're just data structures. Um, think about it as like the desktop on your laptop, right? You so if you're writing an email, and the icon for that email is blue and rectangular. In the middle of your screen, that doesn't mean that the email in your computer is blue and rectangular and in the middle of the computer. Right? Anybody right. who thought that is just misunderstanding the point of the interface. It's, the interface is not there to reveal the truth, the diodes and resistors, the voltages and magnetic fields in right. your computer. The interface is there to hide that complexity and allow you to control the truth while you're ignorant of the truth. Right. And that's what evolution has done is space is just your, your desktop and physical objects are just icons in the desktop. And evolution shaped our, our senses not to show us the truth, but specifically to hide the truth and just to help us act in ways that we need to, to act in order to survive long enough to reproduce. So it's, a, it's that interface idea is, is a, a real shock to most of our intuitions, but it turns out to be a theorem of evolution by natural selection that um, the probability is zero that our perceptions are showing us the truth and the probability is basically one that what evolution has done is given us a user interface that hides the truth and just guides our our behavior to keep us alive but to but not by showing us the truth if you had to toggle voltages in your computer to send an email your friends would never hear from you <laughs> knowing the truth is not an advantage. Right. It's a disadvantage. And that's why evolution hid it from us. And so, so now that's, I needed to say that because now I, I can say what we need to get as empirical data about this question, I mean, is consciousness about all cooperation? What's the role of competition? What's the role of love? What's the role of hate? What are the, what are the roles of these ideas in a fundamental theory of consciousness? And what we're going to have to do is to have our theory of conscious agents and their interactions project it, that back into space time, which is our user interface, the mm. human user interface. And when we do that, the dynamics of conscious agents will have to explain the dynamics of the interactions of biological systems that right. we see in our interface. Right. Some of those interactions are cooperative, like between parents and children. And, and so forth, where, you know, a parent will sacrifice himself or herself for their child out of love. But other interactions are very hostile. 
right? We have in-groups and out-groups. There's the whole field of evolutionary psychology of in-groups and out-groups. And there are even species like the, there's a bird called the, the blue-footed booby, where the, the mother has always lays two eggs, the, the baby chicks hatch, and the first thing they do is fight to the death. One always kills the other, either by pecking it to death or throwing it out in the sun where it cooks. And the mother never stops it. The mother, in fact, killed her sibling. That's why she's there. And from an evolutionary point of view, it turns out there's not enough resources for the mother to successfully raise both chicks. And so the evolutionary problem that is being solved is either siblicide, killing your sibling, or, gen or, or losing the species, essentially genocide. And that's the choice that evolution is faced with. So whatever theory, and, and these are the harsh symbols that we see in our user interface. We see this kind of thing as well. And so whatever theory of consciousness that we come up with, when we, it, it may turn out that deep down consciousness is all about love. And I would love it to come out that way. If that's the case, we have to understand how a theory of consciousness that's all about love, when it gets projected into our user interface, leads to siblicide. Right. Um, right. We, we, so as scientists, we cannot blink. We have to look at all the yeah. data and account mm -hmm. for, for all yeah. the data. And if we can with a theory that's all about love, I'm all for it. But if we can't, then I'm, I have to go wherever the data lead us. What, what about this idea? <clears throat> so consciousness is a, is a harmony-seeking potential. And it gets projected into the rule set of space and time in which it organizes information structures which creates then evolution. And because it organizes these information structures that have a rule set that is essentially alien to its nature, which is space, time, and, and where things start, things end, a whole different set of logic and experience, and it evolves in this alien information structure, and in that process, it sort of creates all the organisms and everything that we see in this material universe or in this experiential universe. And in that process, it sort of loses connection to its own nature. I think through that way, you know, you, you can still explain the desire for harmony and the, you know, the tendency for cells to collaborate and build multicellular organisms, but you can still also explain natural selection and survival of the fittest and the competitive consciousness modalities. I, I agree. I think that that's, in fact, that's one direction that I'm looking to explore uh, to see if, if, if the, the competition that we see in natural selection and the kind of horrors that I just described with the, the blue-footed booby and so, so forth are uh, an artifact of the limits of our perceptual interface, right? Mm -hmm. We are in uh, a, a data structure that's very limiting. Space and time is a mm -hmm. limiting data structure. And in some sense, that may be hiding um, our true nature from ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so I think that that's a, 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 a brilliant direction to explore. And I, I in fact, am, am planning to explore that direction. It's... It's, it also raises a very interesting, deep possibility, and that is um, it, it, there's a certain incompleteness result that's sort of like a girdle's kind of incompleteness. No system can ever fully understand itself. Right. It's the very act of trying to understand yourself requires building models of yourself within yourself and then and that very aspect of building more models is making you more complicated and so now you have to have a more complicated model to model yourself and so you get caught in this trap you can never yeah. understand yourself right. um, and in fact in practical terms the amount that you can really understand about yourself might be very very limited now it, it could be that now that seems not merely to be an artifact of our space-time interface, that might be a fundamental mathematical truth. 
-hmm. about any system, whether it's in space time or not, that even if you're an abstract conscious agent not bound by space and time, um, your ability to, to know yourself is only partial. Now that, that fact that you can only know partly part of yourself may be part of the whole dynamics of consciousness. There, there, there could be this constant churning of, try, of trying to understand yourself mm -hmm. that comes out of the fact that, in fact, you can never completely understand yourself. And that's a very interesting direction, I yeah. think, as well, to, to pursue in all this. <clears throat> and I think also at that level, there, there's, there might be two kinds of understanding. Right? There's the rational, analytical understanding, which comes from observing ourselves and analyzing ourselves. But then there might also be the experiential understanding of just completely being yourself and sort of letting your intellect dissolve and being at the level of conscious agents that are below you, if that makes any sense. Sort of letting your yes, consciousness experience the experience of everything that makes up you. Does that make any sense? I, I think that that's an important direction to go. It, it, you're right that it's not just about rationality. It's also about emotional experiences. And, if, for example, in, in meditation, letting go of rationality, letting go of all thought is one of the, the key right. aspects of, of meditation. The, there is a science of experiences um, from evolution. It's called evolutionary psychology. And it turns out that our, our experiences, for example, of wanting to have revenge, our, our feelings of binding to an in-group and, and having hostility to an out-group and so forth, there is a science of this, the science of evolutionary psychology. And our emotions, all, it turns out all of our emotions um, have a logic underneath them. So... So emotions, and so the, and by the way, that's the first time. It's only in the last 30 or so years that we've actually had a science that can actually treat experiences and, and find an underlying logic behind our experiences, which is not to say I want to reduce emotions to some kind of rational or logical system, but I don't want to ignore that there is a science that shows that there is a rational logic behind our, our emotions. And so as a scientist, uh, I do, it, what's, what's interesting is we find that we get rewarded for two very different activities in life. In meditation, the reward is entirely for absolute silence. Any thought processes on short circuits the process. But when we do when we're not meditating, when we're doing science and we're doing thinking in everyday life, it turns out that we, we get rewarded only for absolute precision. So sloppy thinking, which is where most of us spend most of our lives, doesn't get rewarded either in meditation or in science. It, it gets no reward. It just gets us in trouble. But the world that we live in, science advances and it has advanced because we can be absolutely mathematically precise so that we can find out precisely why we're wrong. And then in meditation, we let go of all mathematics, we let go of everything, and it's pure silence, and then personal transformation seems to happen. Mm. And so any theory of conscious agents is going to have to help us understand why the universe seems to be that way. Why we're rewarded, when we're in the rational mind, we're rewarded for absolute precision, and when we're in meditation, we're rewarded for absolute complete silence, but right. we're never rewarded for sloppy thinking. <laughs> so that's, that's, so, and I don't know the answer to that, but it's, it's, I think as a scientist, what you want to do is to think about all the conditions that a theory has to explain all the facts that need to be explained at some point before you're done. Um, and so this is a challenging, a, a challenging mm -hmm. arena. Have you had any personal experiences that, that, inspired you to start thinking in that direction? Have you had experiences that made you think well, that maybe all I of this meditate. isn't real? 
Well, for, for me, it, it's interesting. I, um, I didn't start meditating until about 15 years ago. So, and I was already thinking about this interface theory and consciousness being fundamental before that. So for me, it wasn't so much a personal experience that led me this direction. It was, I was, you know, just a geeky scientist and I, I realized that the physicalist approach just wasn't working. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I want to understand how conscious experiences are related to neural activity in the brain. And I just wasn't finding it in the physicalist theories that I was trying to come up with that my colleagues were, were right. devising. There was magic in each of those theories. At, at just the critical point where the neural activity creates the consciousness, there was magic. And I don't like magic in my theories. I, I, I want you know, a completely rigorous theory. Yeah. Um, so, in so, science... So it's more rational. Go ahead. It was more rational. You just realized that, so. that this physicalism wasn't going to explain consciousness and and so you started to explore a different theory exactly right one way to think about it was that 99 percent of my colleagues in cognitive neuroscience and and related fields were trying to get physicalist theories and were failing and that's a bad search strategy you know yeah. we shouldn't put all of our eggs in one basket we should you know have at least a few of us looking at other directions. And so I decided, you know, let's, I can't think of any good way to get a scientific theory based on physicalist assumptions. So let's go the other direction and see what we can do. And it turns out it's quite possible to come up with, um, it's, it's, it's fairly, I'll put it this way, it's not a mystery to get space time emerging out of a theory in which consciousness is fundamental. But it's an absolute mystery if you start with space, time, and matter, it's an absolute mystery how consciousness can emerge from that. No one has any idea. Right. It's essentially... So, yeah, for me, it was fashionable. One way is essentially saying, okay, we experience space and time. Therefore, it needs to be fundamental. Therefore, our experience needs to be constructed out of what we experience, which is kind of already... If you really think about it, that's already pretty naive to, to think that that's going to work. It makes more sense... I agree. That's, that's my thing. <laughs> you know, one way to think about it is we have this user interface that evolution shaped in us. It's there to hide the truth because the truth gets in the way. It's too complicated. Um, we just have little eye candy that we need to stay alive to reproduce. And we mistake our little eye candy for reality. And that's, yeah. that's, what, what, that's what physicalism is. It's, mm. it's mistaking the, the, um, the format of our user interface um, for the reality. It's like a person looking at the pixels on their desktop and saying that's the truth of the computer. Right. No, that's just pixels on desktop. They, right. They're there to give you eye candy to, to control the computer, but they're not the truth of the computer. Um, and that's what evolution has done. We have something that allows us to control, at least in part, you know, to interact successfully with objective reality. Mm -hmm while we're completely ignorant of that objective reality. Mm -hmm. So it's essentially, uh, so it's a network that facilitates the interaction between conscious agents by providing them with data streams in, that allows them to interact in a synchronized way. That, that's, that's right. Our, our perceptions like space time, I think of it now as a communication channel. It's an information data right. structure. <laughs> it's a and I'll give you room. one yeah, it's 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 really it, it, think about it as so information theory like error correcting codes, data compression, data structures. So space time is a data format that our species uses, and physical objects are data structures that we create. So I look over and I see an apple. That's a data structure that I create to represent certain fitness payoffs. When I look away, I garbage collect that data structure. I destroy that data structure because I don't need it. And now I look over here and I see a tomato and I make a new data structure. So physical objects are not pre-existing entities. They're data structures that we create on the fly to represent fitness payoffs. And space-time itself is a data structure that we create on the fly. And here's an interesting fact that, or prediction that comes out of this. If space-time is partly an error-correcting code, the way error correction works is you use redundancy to correct errors. So if I want to send you one bit of information, and it could be a zero or a one, 
but I'm worried that if I send you a zero, there's a small chance you might get a one. So what I do is I say, okay, what I'll do is I'm going to send that bit three times. So if I want to send a zero, I'll say zero, zero, zero. If I want to send you a one, I'll send one, one, one. So if you get zero, zero, one, you'll go, oh, well, he meant to send me zero, 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 but there was a little bit of corruption. So I'll just mm -hmm. correct the error. So you can detect the error and correct it. That's So we use, that's the key idea behind all data, you know, essentially error correcting codes, is adding mm -hmm. redundancy so you can detect and correct the error. I think that space is not a fundamental reality, it's an error correcting code that we use for information about fitness and then ultimately about conscious agents. That means that some of the dimensions of space are being used for error correction, and they cannot be used for storing information, right? I can't cheat. When I send you zero, 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 I'm only sending you one bit of information, even though I sent three bits. I can't cheat and try to actually send you three bits of information because that would, that would not work. So, so here's the, the key claim. If at least one dimension of space is for error correction, then I make a clean prediction. You cannot store information in two volumes of space. Volumes of space do not hold information. Now that sounds radical, right? So, so, so I'll, be, I'll, I'll say exactly what I'm claiming here. Imagine you have a volleyball. And I say, how much information could you store inside that volleyball? And you say, well, I could put a five terabyte hard drive in there, and next year maybe a 10 terabyte hard drive. And then the question is, ultimately, is there some limit? How much ultimately information could I stick inside that volleyball? It turns out we know the answer. Stephen Hawking was the one who found the answer. He proved that the amount of information you can stick inside the volleyball does not depend on the volume of the volleyball. It's independent of the volume. It depends only on the surface area. How so? And if that's stunning, it's, uh, that's the point. Everything that we believe about space is wrong. You, you cannot store data into volumes of space. When the only thing, a, a region of space, um, it's only the area of the region of space that determines how much can be stored, not the volume of that region. So for example, if you have a volleyball, you can stick s six smaller spheres in, j that just pack inside that volleyball, and if you do a little math, you'll find out they have about half the volume of the volleyball because there's space in between the spheres. But they have about 3% more surface area than the volleyball. So Hawking's theorem means you can store more data in the six smaller spheres that have only half the volume than you could store into the bigger volleyball. And now you take each one of those little spheres and pack six more into it and keep doing that 20 times you'll find that you, you can store millions of times more information and you have essentially zero volume. That's the universe we live in, which is completely strange if we think that space-time is a fundamental reality. It's perfectly reasonable if space-time is just a data structure that's an error-correcting code. If it's an error-correcting code, then of course you can't use volumes of space to store data because you're using one dimension of space for error correction. How would you so this so th how would you even store information in space? What what exactly do you mean? Well, the intuition is, for example, like a terabyte hard drive, right? Okay. It, it turns out that all the information uh, in that terabyte hard drive um, it depends only on the area surrounding that hard drive, not the volume inside of it. This is called in physics. It's called the holographic principle. If you look up, um, you know, in Wikipedia, the physics of the holographic principle, okay. you'll you'll see this worked out. Physicists themselves have only discovered this in the last 30 years, and they still don't know what it means. That's, that is crazy. I have recently. Th that's right. I've recently heard a physicist say that he has discovered that there are error correcting codes in. The equations of string theory. Have you heard? Of, heard? Of, have you heard about this? That's right. Jim Gates has said this, and uh, there's also um, 
some work. Uh, John Preskill at, at Caltech mm. has has found error correcting code. So Gates and Preskill and Dan Harlow and so forth. I uh, I actually came to this conclusion that space time had to be an error correcting code from from evolutionary arguments. The the idea that space is just a data format that we're using as to to um, store fitness information. And so I, when I realized that a couple of years ago, I went online and said, "Well, have the physicists discovered this yet?" And so I just I just you know Googled space time as an error correcting code and discovered that John Preskill had just published a paper on this, and and you know, Jim Gates is doing this as right. well. And so there is a convergence here. And then the holographic principle uh, really I mean, coincides with this. I mean, it's it. It's saying that three-dimensional space, in some sense, is an illusion. It's it's a holographic pro projection of something that's that that's not three-dimensional. Mm. So so all of these pointers are are very very um, interesting, bringing us to to some new view about space, time, and matter. The physicists themselves are they, they don't know what to make of the holographic principle. They they know that it's important. Some propose that it's really the single, a, a, a key guide light for future progress to understand what space in, in the physical world really is. Yeah. Uh, I, I think that, it, that it's telling us that it's, space is just our desktop. It's a data structure that we've evolved. Yeah, it's um, just a data structure. And we see three-dimensional space because it's, um, it's a low-dimensional error-correcting code. We, we, evolution tries to do things on the cheap. I mean, we could have had a ten-dimensional, uh, you know, code or a twenty-dimensional code, but it's too expensive, and so you know, evolution gave us the cheap model. We only get three dimensions, and that's why we live in a three-dimensional world. <laughs> we're, we're cheap. So, <laughs> so do you think that there is a way to experience firsthand the more fundamental reality, which is hidden through the construct of space and time? Well, I think that the theory of conscious agents proposes that we are not divorced from reality, that I am a conscious agent. My, the, the, the fact that I have experiences, uh, sorry. So, we, so conscious agents have experiences, I have experiences. So, so this theory does suggest that um, we have a chance of understanding objective reality, but we have to be very, very careful. We, we have a history of making mistakes. We thought the earth was flat. Mm -hmm. um, we think that space time is fundamental. We think that matter is fundamental. So everywhere we turn, we've made mistakes. And so I, I view, I think we have a chance. I think an analogy that's very helpful is to think about looking at yourself in the mirror, when you, when you see your face in the mirror, all you see is skin, hair, eyes, just your interface, you, the icon that you built, right? It's right. just a, a physical object icon, your face. But you know firsthand that behind that face is the realm of your, your, desires, your fears, your aspirations, your hopes, um, your love of music, um, your headache, all the, there's the whole rich world of conscious experiences that you know firsthand is hidden by that simple icon that you see in the mirror. Mm -hmm. When you smile, when you, or when you see someone smile, you can guess that their conscious experience is one of happiness, for example, but you don't know for sure, and a smile isn't happiness. And the smile doesn't resemble happiness. Our interface is, allows us to, it gives us a little portal into the realm of conscious agents. Mm -hmm. So, so the, the, to think about this theory of conscious agents, is just look in the mirror. What you see in the mirror is just a simple icon. What you know firsthand is the reality transcends anything that you can see in the mirror. It's, it's the whole world of your the whole universe of your conscious experiences. And that's what I'm proposing is that everything that you see around you is just a, a simple icon 
that behind it is a realm of conscious experiences, just like behind my face icon is the realm of conscious experiences. So I'm not saying my face is conscious. My face is just a symbol. And I'm not saying a rock is conscious. A rock is just a symbol. But those, and sometimes our, our symbols give us an insight into the realm of consciousness. You know, a port, right? So I have some small insight into how you might be feeling mm-hmm. and how you might be thinking, but it's fallible. Yeah. When I look at my cat, my portal is much worse. I have some insight into the experiences of my cat. When I look at an ant, my inter- my user interface is starting to really fail me. And when I look at a rock, I've given up completely, yeah. which I have to because I have only finite resources. And it's an infinite universe of conscious agents out there. So I have to give up. It's, it's clear. Mm. So what we've done is we've mistaken the fact that we have to give up and we've – the limits of our interface, we, we've taken them as an insight into objective reality. The rock looks unconscious, so therefore fundamental reality is unconscious. No, my interface just gave up. And, and right. so we made, we made a mistake. So I think that we do have a chance at understanding the realm of conscious agents because we ourselves are conscious agents. But with great caution, we're also easily self deceived and mm-hmm. self-deluded right and so at every step we have we have to you know get our intuitions have a beer relax get get insights and then go back and be very rigorous about what looked like an insight when i was having a beer yeah. and be mathematically precise because what we found is throughout human history we've been wrong deeply wrong over and over again and we've deeply believed it and so right. today right. is no different and so the only hope we have is, of course, to look at our insights and be and, and be free thinking, but then be as absolutely precise as we can yeah. and say, and then I'll try to say, here's what would prove me wrong. And that's the key point. That's the difference between science and non-science. Mm-hmm. Saying exactly this, if you find this, that would prove me wrong. Right. And that's the key to move forward in mm-hmm. science. Be rigorous enough. To show where you would be wrong, right? Um, if we are conscious agents, and everything else is also conscious agents, then we are sharing this network of conscious agents, and we are interacting with it through the data stream that we experience as time and space. So, if we are focused on data stream of time and space and the physical separation between objects. That is sort of the analytical way of trying to understand it. But perhaps this whole analytical logic is just something that has evolved in time and space. And perhaps underneath all of it is is the conscious agent who is interacting with that framework of logic. So maybe if we could also have right. a deeper insight without any logic. But then at the same time, it wouldn't yeah, be science. <laughs> so Right. And, and so this is a very important point because I, I do think that there are legitimate transformations that happen, for example, in meditation where you let go of all logic and reason. And in fact, it's only when you do that that you get the deep transformations in your personality mm-hmm. uh, and, and deeper insights like that. The, on the other hand, we know that when we're in the area where we're not silent, where, where we're doing some kind of thinking, mm-hmm. we know that humans have typically done sloppy thinking and we've always gotten it wrong. So, so we know that sloppy thinking never gets you anywhere. It, it just gets us in trouble. We know that silence does a a transformation of the human spirit, and we know that precise mathematics, where we can actually say precisely where we might be wrong, has also led to our ability to to send people to the moon and and, and all this modern technology. This is, I think, pointing to a really deep aspect of the universe we live in. Um, And I think we'll see this a lot more when quantum computers become available. In quantum computation, 
you have this very interesting interaction between absolute precision. When you set up the quantum bits and the quantum gates, this is really some of the most precise thinking humans have ever done. To start the computation, you cannot look. You have to let go completely. If you try to look at the computation when it's happening, any kind of reasoning, interaction with it, you destroy the computation. If you don't, enter, it, 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 so in quantum computation, you set up the bits and gates, you start the computation. If you look, you destroy the computation. If you don't look, you unleash this incredible horsepower that we don't understand. It's, it's, it's just, it transcends anything a regular computer can do. So, so here's this incredible horsepower of the universe that happens only when you don't intervene with reason or intervene in any way. And then at the end, you can look at the states of the bits and get a little thimble of the whole torrent of computation that went out. And even that little thimble that you get at the end is, uh, can run circles around the best classical computer. That's the universe we live in. It's, it's again this dynamic between absolute precision on the one side, setting up the bits and gates, really hard-nosed technical stuff, and then letting go completely and allowing the horsepower of the universe to work where our, and any intervention by reason stops it. Any intervention at all, trying to look at it, stops it. Is this really... So, so somehow... Yeah. This is how quantum computers are working right now? Or is this just hypothetical? Oh, no, this is, this is the way they work. And the... Um, yeah, quantum computation they're is already, well understood now. There's people using this already. That if That's they right. Look, There's a, <clears throat> a company called D-Wave, for example. Wow, I had no idea. Yeah. That's pretty... That, that's right. So quantum computers exist. And the, the theory of quantum computation is some of our, our best established mathematical theory. There's, there's no question that you cannot... So, so quantum theorists know for sure that quantum computations get destroyed if you look inside. They, they know that. <laughs> yeah. So, and, and so it's really crazy because, uh, you know, if you've done any programming with regular computers, when you write a program, you can always, you know, put a little trace inside the computer program, say, what are the values of all these variables as this computing? Because I need to debug it, to figure out what went wrong. But if you do that in a quantum computer, you destroy the computation. You cannot trace it while it, you destroy it. <clears throat> So it's a very, very different kind of wow. um, thing that we're dealing with. <laughs> That's very so, deep. So reason, it's just pretty wild, yeah. pretty wild. Yeah. So, you know, the arguments that I gave against the idea that we see that, that space and time and physical objects um, are the objective reality because evolution shapes us not to see the truth. It shapes us to have an interface. Those arguments, as it turns out, do not apply to logic and reason. So the, the, my, my arguments that only apply to perceptions of space and time and physical objects, but not to logic and reason themselves. And, and for, for this reason, there are, within evolution, there are selection pressures to reason about fitness. I need to understand that two bites of an apple give me uh, roughly twice the fitness payoff of one bite of an apple. Not that I need to understand it intellectually, but I have to, my, my actions need to embody that fact. <laughs> and so there are selection pressures for modest facility with basic mathematics, also for logic, because we're a social species. If I do something for you, I might expect later on you're going to do something for me in return. And so there's this logic of social, and that's a logic. And so there are, again, selection pressures for basic facility in mathematics and logic. Um, you know, space, time, and objects, the selection pressures are completely against truth. In the case of mathematics and logic, the selection pressures are not completely against truth. They're not selection pressures to make us geniuses. So I, I'm not saying there's any selection pressures for us to be geniuses, um, just enough, you know, to, to stay alive. And every once in a while, the genes come together and you get, you know, some genius like a David Hilbert or, a, you know, John von Neumann, who's a mathematical genius. But most of us have a hard time balancing our checkbooks. You know, that's it's, you know, that's that's what we got. <laughs> so. 
So what? So reason and mathematics sort of escapes the the logic that I was saying before about space, time, and objects. Um, but whether reason and logic are fundamental truth about reality, that's a deep, deep philosophical question. Thanks for watching this interview. I hope that these thoughts triggered some creative and inspiring emotions because I think if we start to think about the nature of reality and consciousness and the way science is trying to make sense of this universe, we start to realize how much creative potential there is in the exploration of reality and that there's so little known and that we ourselves are capable of looking inward, of, of, of researching, of reaching out to specialists and of coming up with a new way of, of viewing what it means to be a human being, what it means to be a conscious being. Anyway, peace. Thank you for watching this interview. Donald D. Hoffman doesn't think it's real.